In this episode, we are going to talk about an interesting topic, which is modern enterprise e-commerce storefronts. What storefront is and then how it is used in enterprises. Well, I'm Fi Prakovki. I'm a co-founder and CTO of Alokai, previously uh, called Vue Storefront. So if there's anyone from the Vue.js community, you probably know this project. So just to give a little bit of information about myself, I've been coding since I was 13. You mentioned storefront, right? So it's okay, decoupling, but like, what was the solution before? I mean, you said you started the storefront yeah. thing, uh, or the mag mag Magento was the first thing, like mm -hmm. which is expensive, but there might have been some solution before this because e-commerce is big, right? I mean, people have been doing e-commerce since early 2000. So uh, Phil, another question on the UI library. So like, of course, uh, as part of Alakai, you offer the end-to-end -end solution, right? You have your orchestration layer, your backend, your frontend. So which part of those are actually open source? I mean, you know, like uh, half of the show, I, I, I've been shamelessly promoting what we are building. And I think it, I already made my point that it is something that is just great for enterprises. And if you are considering building an enterprise uh, e-commerce application, just please take a look at Alokai if you like it. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of This Is Tech Talks and this is episode 12 and uh, we are happy to have Philip uh, who is joining as a guest today. Hey Philip, how are you? Hey Santos, uh, it's amazing to see you, it's amazing to see both of you and it's absolutely, uh, I'm honored to be here really. Thank you for joining and uh, we have our co-host today uh, with us, Sonu. Hey Sonu, how, how is uh, how's the week and how it's going so far? Hey, uh, yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Everything is good so far. Uh, so in this episode, we are going to talk about an interesting topic, which is modern enterprise e-commerce storefronts. I mean, uh, of course, I have done uh, some uh, chat with Philip in the past. I also spoke to some of his teammates about storefronts. But we thought about like bringing it on the show, like how what storefront is, is and then how it is used in enterprises and what his company is doing. Because he recently, the company, uh, Philip, uh, uh, runs not works for basically but yeah the company he runs it is renamed to a new a new name and then we are interested to see like what uh, what uh, he's doing as part of that company but uh let's go ahead and start with the introduction so philip would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself first yeah so well i'm phil prakovsky i'm a co-founder and cto of alokai previously uh called we storefront so if there's anyone from the vjs community you probably know this project so just to give a little bit information about myself, I've been coding since I was 13. And when I was 14, I was basically starting with some silly C++ stuff, then doing a little bit of PHP, then I learned JavaScript and I fell in love with that. Then I unfortunately had to earn money uh, to stay on studies. So then I learned WordPress and I started doing a lot of WordPress. At some point I just got bored. And when I got bored, I joined uh, a software house in my city, in the city I was studying at, uh, Divanta. And I started working with more ambitious projects. And this is actually what I wanted. Like you, if you do a lot of WordPress and WooCommerce applications, like at some point it becomes totally repetitive and basically you're just copy pasting what you have done previously. It's a great business because you just copy paste what you've done before. And you know, the things that used to take months right now, they're taking weeks. But it's boring and you're not growing. And you know, when you are, I think I was 20 at that time, like you just want something more ambitious. So I joined this software house called Devante and I started working with other technologies. Uh, one of them was Magento. The main one was Magento. So Magento, for those who don't know, it's an e-commerce platform, very well known also from its open source offering. I think they had one of the biggest open source communities in the world, like overall. Like there were Magento contribution days happening in many countries almost every week. There were literally like thousands of people on Meet Magento events, which were like local Magento events uh, in different countries. And then at some point Magento got acquired by Adobe and Adobe tried to kill all of that. Uh, but that's another story. So I was at this company and I was working with Magento, a PHP driven platform where as a front-end developer, honestly, we're working, working with uh, very ancient technologies like Prototype.js. Do you, do you even remember Prototype.js? Some of you, I mean, I have, I have done ESP. That's the oldest I know. Active yeah, these, these, these technologies were really ancient. And even when Magento 2 came, 
uh, it, they were still working with very old technologies like Knockout JS, for example. Knockout JS is kind of like a father of uh, reactivity, you could say. But that's that's the side thing. In general, like the developer experience of a front-end developer, it was quite poor, to put it nicely. Uh, and you know, we were missing out. We we're missing out on all of those amazing things like React, all of those amazing things like Vue.js, Angular. Uh, I actually started working for quite for like a few months on a different project within the same company because I was complaining a lot about uh, Magento. I was moved to a project called Open Loyalty. It was a SaaS platform built by this uh, by this company. And this SaaS platform, they had a separated backend in PHP and separated frontend in Angular JS. And they were communicating through API. So that was my fir the first time I actually tried something different than a monolithic platform like uh, Magento. And so that you can work differently. You can have frontend code base separated, backend code base separated. Me as a frontend developer, I was only creating Jira tickets for, for the backend team if I wanted something from the API. That was all I had to do. And I was working with the world that I knew very well. I was owning it. I was iterating very fast. Uh, I had to learn like 10 times smaller code base. And I had full control over the performance. So this allowed me to iterate much faster. This gave me, honestly, 10 times more joy from the work. Also, AngularJS at that time, it was, it was solving a lot of problems also related to the UI. Uh, things that were super hard to do with jQuery suddenly were just a piece of cake with uh, the Angular JS templating and, uh, and controllers. Not to mention the SPA itself. Like at, at that time, it was, it was a bit crazy concept, also mentally, just to think this way. But I really like that. And I was at this project for some time. Then I had to switch back to Magento. And I started thinking, like, OK, so. You know, if I had such a great experience and there was so much acceleration and so much quality improvements coming from the fact that actually we can split those things so we can split the back end from the front end, like, can we have exactly the same thing with uh, Magento? And that was something that, along with other things like slowness of Magento and problems with basically hiring front end developers that liked Magento and wanted to work with that, this catalyzed the creation of this storefront. So, what we did is we created a simple POC at that time in React for uh, headless Magento. So we communicated with Magento only for API. It was acting only as a backend layer. The frontend layer was written in React.js. And what we very quickly learned is that React is quite hard to learn, even for frontend developers, but at that time also for backend developers and full-stack developers. So we started looking for something else. Uh, Angular was on a table for some time, but that was the time of the transition. So there was Angular.js, Angular 2, was yeah. already announced, but not stable yet. And we needed something uh, to work on immediately. So this mm -hmm. is how we came up with Vue.js. And everyone loved it. It was super easy to work with. We're also discussing Aurelia.js at that time. And I'm glad we didn't choose it, because I don't think Aurelia is doing very well uh, right now. But yeah, we, we took a good bet. So we've built a boilerplate, a full boilerplate with the full e-commerce functionality, like a home page, product page, category page, checkout. All of that based on the Magento API is completely separated from the backend. We've put that on GitHub. And this is how it all started. This is how this is how Vsurfon started. There was a lot of interest from the Magento community. And you know, Magento community was very well known from contributing to open source projects and being very community driven. So they immediately jumped into that. Like we had really hundreds of contributors. Right now, I think it's Vsurfon is in total has like 400 or something like that uh contributors so we were as as people say we were cool at that time uh, we're the cool kid in the block a new technology everyone wanted to you know try it out we're invited into conferences etc so this is this is essentially what 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 the store from this and these are the benefits that you're getting like you have faster development uh it's much easier to onboard anyone into the project Generally, they are considered being faster uh, just because the backend code is not impacting the frontend code. But the, the reality is not always like that. Uh, like building well-performing single-page applications is uh, is a challenge. It is it is just a challenge, uh, and you have much more flexibility. So because you're only communicating with uh, the backend application for the API, 
don't have limitations. In the team plating, you don't have any kind of constraints that this platform is putting on you. You just build the UI uh, in the framework that you know, and you really don't care about any any kind of limitation that the backend platform is giving you to the degree that if even an API is limiting, you can very easily replace that without any problems. Uh, so this is more or less what, what headless is and what storefront is. It's a deep coupling of front end and the back end and then communicating with the back end services for an API. So uh, you mentioned storefront, right? So it's okay, decoupling, but like, what was the solution before? I mean, you said you started the storefront yeah. thing uh, or the Magento was the first thing, like which mm -hmm. gives dispenser, but there might have been some solution before this because e-commerce is big, right? I mean, people have been doing e-commerce since early 2000. Yeah, so like, what was the solution before? So Magento in general, like the, the way how Magento was built, it is called like a monolithic architecture, which means that you basically have one application that is responsible for the presentation part, for the business logic part, and also for the data part. You just have one application that caters it all. And you deploy it uh, in the, like as, as one app, not separately. Uh, which means that you know when it grows over time, you have a huge code base, and obviously there is a lot of patterns uh, on that, on the architecture side uh, around modularization and this sort of things that are aiming to cut this code base into smaller pieces. And even Magento, it has like a modular architecture. But the problem with monoliths is that, and with every project. Uh, you know, we are all developers. We know that the entropy in the project is growing and you could have wonderful patterns, but the reality is when you have a deadline, you are starting to make some deviations of those patterns that you have established just to deliver on time. They accumulate over time and sooner or later, it is just becoming a mess. And it was like that with all the monoliths, like over time, they were becoming very coupled with each other. So you, you were changing one thing in the one part of the application and suddenly like 10 other parts were breaking. You had absolutely no idea why, because logically they shouldn't be connected, but they were. For some reason, you had a hotfix on top of a hotfix. You also had abstractions on top of abstractions because people tried to simplify some things without having time to refactor, etc., cetera, et cetera. So, so this was the reality of working with monoliths. And as soon as you had like a simple application, a very simple e-commerce application, it was not a problem. When it was an enterprise application that had very complicated logic, a lot of features, like monoliths, they were just not the best solution to that. Like having a one big application that takes care of everything resulted in having a huge code base, very long deployments, uh, being super prone to errors. And these things are not easy to test manually or uh, in an automated way. So this is why, you know, people started to look for other solutions. And this is why people started decoupling this and this started the headless movement. And right now we are even further because in enterprise, we also have something called composable. And composable is not only decoupling the front end, but also splitting uh, the backend piece into multiple services. So instead of ha having like a single API backend like e-commerce, we're also having a separate application that is a CMS. We're having a separate application. And CMS could be contentful, for example. Separate application that is a search, which is Algolia. Uh, we can have separate application for personalization. We can have separate application for order management. And this way, we are just using like t even 10 different APIs, which is very granular and responsible for one thing. They're all plugged into the front end, very often not directly into the front end, but to like a layer in the middle that is called uh, API gateway or these days it is being renamed like digital experience orchest orchestration because the e-commerce industry it loves to reinvent itself and just have some cool names for the old things uh, with a little bit more specialization. So so this is what is the state of the art architecture uh, for e-commerce days. It is very, I would say it is very granular, uh, which is great because you have this flexibility of like changing things that you don't like Maybe there was something new that came up in the market and you would like to change that. So you have that flexibility to do this and you're not ending in the situation that I described at the beginning. So you're not ending in a situation where everything in your code base is so coupled with each other that you're even afraid to make a change. Because these days, like when you have a business, what really matters is, is that you're basically able to adapt to, you know, to the things that are changing. Like we have AI right now. Everyone wants to integrate AI into their stack, into their application, etc. But if you are having a huge molly for everything is coupled with each other, 
it is super hard. Like personalization, I think personalization in e-commerce was like the same thing as AI, but like five years ago. So, you know, there's a lot of trends and you need to adapt into those trends. And like from the architecture perspective, the granular architecture, when you have like separate services, not coupled with each other, maybe a layer in the middle that is just is possible for integrating them together is, is the best one. Excuse me? Yeah. So, uh, no, I would just ask Sonu if he has any questions. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that sounds all amazing. So I'm just wondering, you know, did you look also at um, existing uh, platforms, you know, that provide something similar to yours, you know, or mm -hmm. did you... Um, did you look at them and, and, and you saw that maybe they did not have what you were looking for? Like, like how did you decide, you know, that, okay, none of this is working for us. You know, like we, we need mm -hmm. our own thing and, and this is why we need it. What do you need, mean by our own thing? You mean like, I'm not sure if I get the question, like, would you mean that if someone is looking for a solution like that, like if they are looking for building it on your own or having something that is already pre-made or like what you mean exactly? No, I mean, so you said you looked at Magento, right? And Magento, mm -hmm. uh, problems with Magento, that's why you came up ah. uh, with your own storefront. Did you look mm -hmm. at other solutions as well? You know, for example, Shopify is big now. Ah, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I don't know how big it was back then when you started with storefront. So I'm just, just trying to uh, see if there's any other comparables you did. Yeah, so the truth is, like, at that time, like, you know, I was working in the agency that had partnership with Magento that was earning a lot of money on Magento. So, like, leaving Magento was not an option. Uh, obviously, you know, when you are a vendor, not an agency, then you have a little bit more flexibility because you're not tied to a specific technology. And I think at that time, the only available solution that was actually API first, and it was more like a SaaS than a a, you know, a bunch of code that you're deploying and editing. There was commerce tools, but it was super young. Like it was super young. So at that time, I would say like the whole world was monoliths, especially for the enterprise commerce, because Shopify at that time, it was mostly suitable for small shops. Mm -hmm. uh, Magento was really like the cool kit at that time. It started to have some problems uh, at scale, but you know, before Magento, there were things like demandware. There were a few th things like uh sap commerce which is hybrids like they were also huge and they were even bigger monoliths so magento was still a monolith but more leaner cooler like with a modular architecture uh so it was it, it was good on its own but it had problems and whenever we have some problems in the tech industry uh we are looking for solutions an api first approach just having apis on top of uh, a monolithic application I, it was 2017, so it was not something exotic, but trust me, like in the e-commerce, it, was it, it, it wasn't coming out of the box. Like ability to just call something from an API, it was not that obvious. Sometimes you just had APIs for like third party integrations at best, but not like a complete set of API coverage that was allowing you to actually develop something on top of that. You very often needed extensions for that. Uh, so, you know, we... We tried to do this within Magento. We tried to like understand what is the root of the problem and, and break it down. And we thought that decapping the front end could be actually the solution. And it was to some of the problems for sure. And uh, of course, we can uh, talk a little bit more about the storefront. So like, like, why do you think like storefront is the best solution for enterprises? So. Uh, of course, they have all, already have a solution. Like, but why they should move to storefront? Uh, so first of all, like I don't think it's the best solution for enterprises. Uh, I think like there is no one size fits all. And actually, in the e-commerce space, especially Magento space, there was a situation when everyone became overly excited about headless. Everyone started migrating to headless because everything. You know, every problem that they had was promised to be solved, like better flexibility, better performance, better reliability, happier developers, like a beautiful world, really. The only problem is that, you know, this is just a technology, like technology on its own won't solve any problem for you. It's just an approach. Uh, and at that time, it was an approach that was allowing you to have a clean start on the front end. 
But the problem was like there was not enough knowledge about the drawbacks of this technology. There was not enough knowledge about how to implement that. So what happened in the Magento industry, and it was actually heavily promoted by Google at that time as well. And they are kind of responsible for, for this uh, hype among the industry and a lot of migrations is that everyone migrated to headless without even asking themselves a question like, is it really what I need? Like, for example, if I have a poor performance, is it really worth like rebuilding the front end completely? Or maybe I should just, you know, optimize what I have right now and just find clever ways of doing that. Like no one asked those questions. Like everyone were kind of fooled by those bright slogans and they migrated to headless. And a lot of them, a lot of them migrated back because headless and uh, headless is, is, is a solution to the problem of scale and not all enterprises. Uh, has has this problem like you have a lot of enterprise grade applications that are rather simple like uh, a lot of retail shops etc they could probably live well with a monolith uh, maybe a monolith that just they are aware of its limitations and they're trying to proactively prevent them but not necessarily always going to headless uh, but i would say for majority of enterprises indeed like having a separate storefront like having this headless application or even composable architecture that would be the best approach to just not have something that you will have to rewrite at some point. Like when we are building software as software developers, like we like to build software that lasts. Like we, of course, like there is always a new framework, a new paradigm, and everyone wants to rewrite. But you know, we are developers. Like we love those things, right? But from a business perspective, like they just don't want that. From a business perspective, ideally, they they would like to invest into something. And they would like to be able to gradually improve that without uh, rewriting it. Because when you're rewriting something from the business standpoint, you're very often ending up with like two applications, the new one and the old one. And you have to maintain both because the new one, for some reason, cannot uh, just have exactly the same scope as the old one for a very long time. You know, you estimated the project to just be six months and it's been third year since you started and it's still happening like we all on, we all know those uh, situations, right? So, so we would like to have something that we can actually gradually modernize. And I think this is something great for enterprises that already have monoliths and have problems, that if they want to migrate, uh, if they want to embrace this new architecture, this headless architecture, just like we did, like they don't need to migrate out of like Magento or SAP or whatever. They just need to decouple the front end, keep everything that they had at the bottom, and just and just still have uh, like ninety percent of the old stack as it was. But what we are improving is just this front end layer. Actually, the most important layer because again, when you think from a business standpoint, when you have a customer, the customer is clicking through front end. The customer has absolutely no idea if this is SAP, Magento, whatever on the back end. They they are just clicking through the front end, and what they care really is that it works, it's fast, and it looks nice. These are the only three things. Obviously, uh, it's good if we as developers would also care about it being accessible because not everyone has a luxury of just clicking through this uh, as it is. Uh, and I think regulations actually are going into a very good direction in, in, in that regard. But in general, like this is what matters, right? So also, if you think like when why it is good for the enterprises, is it, it is good for the enterprises because they can have full control over the customer experience layer, the, the layer that actually the customers are interacting with. Even if they have like super old backend uh, technology, they really don't need to take this risk of moving out of this. Of course, like if it is at some point limiting them, if it is at some point uh, just making it not worth to maintain, they can still do this. But if you're looking at this from the pragmatic perspective, like if you decouple the front end, you are not only allowing yourself to iterate faster on the customer experience layer. You're not only allowing yourself to maybe replace some of the APIs, like maybe search CMS, uh, but also you are giving yourself a full control over how it is being perceived by the customer. I mean, this that, story reminds me uh, more of microservices and GraphQL. Like they, they were at like really a type and now like everyone is moving away from GraphQL for some reason. I mean, but yeah, this 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 things happen. Like, of course, our industry tries to reinvent things, try it out, and then everyone starts adopting, and then they realize, okay, this was not an issue for us, but we just went with the hype, and then 
yeah, we just wasted our few years. Yeah, I think, you know, with GraphQL, it was a very similar situation as it used to be with headless. Like people get overexcited about this. People felt that it will solve all of their problems on the API layer. But in reality, it just created a bunch of nuance. Like, for example, caching. Caching is a huge challenge with GraphQL. Uh, and of course, like we're having more and more tools that, that are allowing to do this in a good way. But still, like federating multiple APIs, especially if you have like a third party API that is not following the open uh, API spec, federating this into GraphQL, it's a nightmare. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I think it's, it's, it's generally a team in the industry. Like we, we like new shiny things. We're kind of not looking at uh, the potential downsides of this. We are looking mostly on the upsides and the fact that it's cool, that it's easy to work with, that developer experience is better. Honestly, like same thing happened with single page applications, right? Yeah. Do you remember? Like everyone adopted them. And then what we learned that they are basically slow by default because we are throwing like three megabytes of JavaScript to the front end. And right now, what all the front end frameworks are doing, they're trying to do damage control. They're trying to figure out how not to break yeah. every all the applications, how to be backwards compatible, but at the same time, maybe come back to the servers. Maybe, maybe doing everything on the front end was not the best idea. Yeah. So, so it's interesting, like how you know we like to reinvent ourselves in, in the technology. How the technological teams are pushing those things to business in the companies. The business is investing into that. Then we are seeing that something was problematic. We are seeing new solution. Uh, the technology is pushing this to the business again. Like this is honestly how we are making this economic so great. It's a rewrite after rewrite. I mean, you can take, for example, React. Right? React is all, all, all like already recommending don't use React. Just go ahead and use Next.js or any other SSR framework. And now. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure like how many people are aware, but Angular is also taking the same route in some ways because they are merging an existing SSR framework, which is uh, Wiz, which exists yes. inside Angular. So they are merging Angular with Wiz to make to make sure that your SSR experience is better, of course. So everyone is taking that route, and now we are back to early 2000 where server side rendering was cool. Yeah, exactly. And we have to rewrite part of what we have. But actually, I'm glad you mentioned that because honestly, I think like Angular, at least, you know, like I know we all live in the different bubbles, but in my bubble, like Angular at some point just stopped to be cool. It started to be too enterprisey, even for enterprises. Uh, and I think they're back on the very good track. I think that even uh, the previous release is Angular 17. Like it was, it was a very good one, but merging with this, like introducing resumability, the sort of concepts, I think it's, it's gonna put Angular as one of the best performing frameworks. Period. Like, and I think that's great, and that's something that Vue.js cannot compete with at, right now. That's something that React cannot compete with. So yeah, it's gonna be super interesting to see because <laughs> Angular is apparently back in a game. Yeah. Talk, talking about Angular, um, I saw you are providing, you know, um, um, ways to install it for Vue, for React, and Quake. Uh, you mm -hmm. have the storefront UI. Any plans for Angular? Not yet. I mean, we have a contributor who started uh, building their own version of storefront UI for Angular. But right now, we are even competing with Angular. So we are very present in the SAP space, for example. And SAP has its own uh, headless framework called Spartacus, which is built in Angular. Also, fun fact, I, I was helping to build it. So at that time, like there was only Vue Storefront having monopoly for knowledge on headless commerce. And SAP approached us to help them to do this. Uh, but uh, at some point, I would love to. Like, you know, right now, just from the business standpoint, honestly, like we shifted from Vue. I mean, we're still supporting Vue, but we started supporting React simply because it became a problem for us. Like, it became a problem for us to sell, especially in the US. Like, in US, Vue.js, it's, it's a super tough sell. In Europe, there was a lot of agency who used to do React, but they were like, ah, yeah, okay, we can learn Vue.js. Not, not a problem. But that wasn't the case in US. So this is why we also adopted React and also just made a lot of things that we have backend agnostic. We don't have plans for you know implementing Angular simply because there is no one asking for this uh, or there is, it's, it's never a deal breaker. But just purely from my engineering uh, 
perspective, I would love to see that at some point. Like we have this one community member who is at least uh, adjusting storefront UI to Angular. I would love to see the whole storefront built on Angular, especially this new version that will have resumability, etc. I would love to see performance. Like for those who don't know, like uh, basically most of my career, I've been doing things related to web performance. I've been educating about this a lot. I, I did a lot of talks about web performance. I've been always fascinated and kind of obsessed about this topic. This is why I'm looking at uh, Angular right now in a completely different way. And this is why I'm super, super excited about that. Because Quick, for, for example, it was a, it's a great idea, very well executed. Uh, but the problem is like they need more, much more force to push it. Angular has this force. So right now, if you have a very good product, like objectively very good product with some unique offering, I'm very curious like how far it will go. I'm very curious like how many people will come back to Angular, like pick it back up uh, and start playing with that because syntax is already fixed. Like the universality of Angular with SSR is fixed. The front-end performance, I think, is uncomparable to anything else due to resumability. Maybe Quick, but again, Quick is very young framework. Like it needs to prove itself. Uh, so yeah, I'm curious. I'm curious if we will start having customers who will just be asking about Angular. That would be a great win for, I think, a win-win for all the frameworks because once they open source, Wiz, probably other frameworks can take our uh, motivation, right? Or they can like refer to the code base because that's something on production for ages. I mean, uh, your Google search, YouTube, they are they are using Wiz. So making it open source will be, I think, a great win for everyone. But yeah, we are not talking about Angular here. Uh, let's back get back to storefront. So, of course, uh, we we are almost close to our uh, episode. So, one question. So you started the company named as Wo Storefront. Now it's mm -hmm. named as Alokai. I mean, you I saw the announcement a few weeks back. So why that move? Why you change it back? Uh... Okay, so first of all, like, you know, I told you that we are doing React and that was already a problem. Like imagine even promoting this and selling this to customers. Like, yeah, right now we have Vue Storefront for React. Or we have Vue React Storefront. Uh, that was problematic, especially that when you look at the landscape and developers, they're treating this very dogmatic. Like for, for a lot of people, like saying Vue.js React Storefront is almost like a heresy. Because in, in either one or other camp. Uh, so from our perspective, it, it was just a branding issue. It was very hard to sell that. It was very hard to promote that. Uh, at the same time, the company itself evolved a lot. Like we used to be a cool open source project. We used to have like thousands of people in the community uh, and, and also a lot of shops on the SME level, like so small, medium uh, businesses. We have like 2000 shops, like on the small, small, medium segment, for example. But we shifted. We shifted to like more enterprise uh, great projects, to more enterprise great customers. Uh, also, our offering it is no longer the storefront. Like we have the UI library, we have the storefront, we have the orchestration and integration layer, we have the infrastructure, uh, we have the SaaS that is managing all of those things. So, you know, when you when you go and pitch view storefront the value that the customer sees is very narrow, even though we have a lot of other things. So we had to do this rebranding. And we we're actually thinking about this rebranding for quite some time. And there's a great story about that because Alokai, uh, it means to guide. And it's also coming from the word Alakai, which is like a conductor, uh, like an orchestra. And what we, what we love to tell the customers is that, okay, how to explain the value of the product. And that was actually super exciting. Like I, I highly recommend whenever someone is doing a rebranding or just figuring out the name of their company, like think about the story behind the name because, because it's much easier to sell the value. We're thinking, okay, so imagine that you are a musician and you're writing a song and you wrote a great song and now you want it to be performed. Like, would you, you, would you build the building on your own? Like, would you do the marketing for the concert on your own? Like, would you hire every musician or would you just go to an orchestra and let them do this, right? Obviously, you would do the second one. So this is how we are trying to, you know, uh, make the customer realize like what is the difference between building all of those things on their own, like this, the whole storefront and orchestration there, etc., on their own, versus just going with us. And I think you know there is a lot of market education still around that because the front end, the value of the front end is is being under underrepresented and underappreciated because 
the e-commerce platforms and the backends were always the center of the universe. But you know, this mindset is changing. Uh, well, this is more or less like the reasoning why we changed to Alokai. Uh, also, I'm not sure if I should mention that, but there is also a Hawaiian wheat strain uh, called Alokai, which we found out a little bit later. So do you have questions? Uh, any questions from your side? Uh, no, I think I'm okay. Uh, I'm okay for now. Thank you. Okay, good. So uh, Philip, another question on the UI library. So like, of course, uh, as part of Alakai, you offer the end-to-end -end solution, right? You have your orchestration mm -hmm. layer, your backend, your frontend. So which part of those are actually open source? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so basically the, the skeleton is open source. So like you can build uh, an application using Alokai, like completely for free using our open source technology. So we have the UI library, we have our uh, store from Boilerplace for Next and Nux. They have just smoked the data, but these are like fully storefronts using storefront UI. Uh, the middleware, which is our integration layer, this is also open source, and also SDK, which is like a tool to talk to the middleware from the front end. So the whole stack is is free. What is not free, what, what is our enterprise offering is basically integrations to that. Like you can always build your own integrations, but as soon as we start doing that, we realize that it's a lot of work. Also like modules for B2B, like a fully working storefront connected to those integrations. Uh, Unified data layer. So we have a layer that is actually an abstraction layer to all of uh, the APIs underneath. So the front end is unaware what APIs it is connecting to. So you can very easily switch them. Uh, infrastructure, all of that is being part of the enterprise offering. So how we differentiate that is that if you are building a small shop, but you would like to leverage the headless architecture, uh, the open source offering is perfect for you. Like we, we are where we are because of the community. The community lifted us up to this position. So we want to give back. Uh, but at the same time, whenever we are talking about like the enterprise great features, whenever we are talking about the SLAs infrastructure uh, and more sophistic sophisticated functionalities, uh, then we are just having this as part of our page tier. And on you know, it is super hard to uh, have a proper offering as an open source company to have an enterprise offering that is actually appealing to the right customers without appealing the open source offering and vice versa. Uh, so this is something that is working for us very well right now. Obviously, there are always situations when you have some agency or some customer who is using your open source stuff and building their own uh, integrations just because they don't want to pay you. But honestly, I think, you know, First of all, like it's like 90% of the value you have to build on your own. Like you could build that using any other technologies anyway, like Next.js Commerce or something like that. Uh, and if someone just wants to do this on their own and maintain this on their own and have this risk of doing that, I'm, I'm fine with that. Like the, those cases are always happening, but you have someone from your enterprise ICP who is actually using open source to do things for free. But I still think it is worth giving back. I still think, you know, those more than 2,000 shops, uh, this is a huge commitment for us to the community uh, to keep those things open source, keep maintaining them, and, and keep making them better. Uh, when we talk about UI libraries, you have only, uh, well, what is the offering for mobile, right? For web, of course, you have React, and we also have Do, but and Quick as well. But any mm -hmm. specific, uh, like native libraries? No, we don't have anything native, uh, unfortunately. Sergey, you know Sergey, uh, Sergey yeah. Kirianov, he did a POC uh, using our middleware and SDK on React Native, but we are not targeting any, um, we're not targeting any native environments yet, because honestly, it would be quite cool to have something for for Tauri or for React Native, and maybe you know, at some point we will, because we we are starting to have some customers who are actually asking about. Having a unified UI library also for their uh, for the mobile applications. Yeah, it's it's an interesting topic, but so far like not yet. No, it's open source and everyone can make an integration. So if there is anyone here listening to us who would like to do this, just write me on Twitter. I would love to have a discussion about that. We already had someone uh, who built integration for Quick, uh, Georgia Ba. Georgia, if you are listening to this, you are goat. Uh, we also have Runi Azak, who is building an integration for Angular. So you can join this wonderful pack and build another one. 
Nice. I mean, and a great thing, like you are, of course, running a company, but you're still giving back to the open source, which not many enterprises are doing. So, uh, yeah, thanks for doing that. Well, honestly, I would like to give back even more, but maybe at some point we will. Yeah. In the so, end, what matters is that you have to make business. And when business is going good, then you can give back even more. Yeah. Great. So uh, all the uh, links are actually in the uh, notes and in the description. You can find the GitHub link and you can also find uh, the LFI link, which we discussed about. I'll, uh, you can also find the email ID and uh, Twitter link to Philip uh, on in the description as well. So we are very close to uh, uh, the, the podcast, uh, Philip. So one question we generally ask, like, would you like to promote something on the show? Uh, of course, we promoted Alokai, but in case do you have you have anything else? I mean, you know, like oh, half of the show, I, I I've been shamelessly promoting what we are building, and I think it. I already made my point. That it is something that is just great for enterprises. And if you are considering building an enterprise uh, e-commerce application, just please take a look at Alokai. If you like it, amazing. If you don't like it, it's still great. There is no one size fits all. But if I can have a chance to promote some things that I personally find very interesting in our space, uh, that should that should that should actually get some attention. And they are also not very indie already, already but I still think they're worth looking at. So if there is someone who haven't tried Astro, try Astro. Just just please do this. Like if you're building a website, not an application, this is probably something that, that will just solve all of your problems. Uh, also, Astro can right now work with Quick, which is even more interesting because you can build something that is both uh, an application and a website in a very performant way. So this is a super cool thing that I would just like to promote shamelessly and, and ask people to, to take a look at. Uh, yeah, and that's... I think that's it. So, anything uh, from your side? Sorry, repeat that. You want to add anything before we wrap up? Uh, no, I think I'm good. I mean, th this was a great introduction. I was actually not aware of uh, the product before that, uh, and and even the um, uh, the headless version of it, right? Like, I have done e-commerce for a long time, but you know, understand it a traditional way. You you, you can say right. Mm -hmm. Uh, and yeah, I hear your pain points about Magento. I've, you know, touched it a little bit. I would say not too detailed, but I've touched it. And then I know there was a, um, a lot of problems with their HTML and it's like a, too many divs and like a, uh, nested tree of the divs that never ends. So yeah. I, I, I know what you're saying. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm glad I came to know about this product. Thank you for, for the introduction and explaining it. Well, thank you for having me and thank you for giving me a little bit of uh, time and opportunity to actually go through the honestly like very interesting history of like the e-commerce and the enterprise e-commerce because uh, I think a lot of things that are happening in the enterprise e-commerce space, they can be very easily translated to basically any type of project. And there is a lot of lessons in there also about architecture, about the approach to software in general, uh, you know, that there are no one ultimate solutions to all the problems. There are only like preferences and you, you should always like look for the right solution. Uh, and the, the general idea of composability of headless of like breaking down what is complex into smaller pieces that can be easily replaced. I think this is something super cool. And and honestly, I would like to see much more of that in this, in, in this world. I know microservices were an attempt to that. And I think they are still being used very heavily also in the enterprise e-commerce. But the composable world, it is, it is something like a layer higher. Like instead of having microservices, you're actually having services. They, they are calling this package business units. So it's a little bit smaller granularity. And, and I love that, you know, our programming world and architecture, they're evolving, experimenting with different flavors. I'm super curious how those things will gonna look like, like in two years, for example, when the AI will have more to say, like what, what AI will figure out. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much, guys, for having me. It was a wonderful conversation. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah. Thanks again, Philip, uh, for being here. So uh, we will be back in next episode. So next in next episode, we are talk we are going to talk about three D printing uh, with Gina. So I'm I'm sure if you are into three D printing, you might have heard about Octoprint. And uh, Gina is uh, the person behind Octoprint. She has been doing it since long, long time. She is full time 
open source, uh, doing open source for Octoprint. So we're excited to like uh, post on the next episode and see you soon. See you. Bye bye.